You're watching a special edition of the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. Our guest this episode is Commander Alexander Armitas, the new flight leader and commanding officer for the United States Navy Blue Angels Flight Demonstration Squadron. Just over a month into his new role, Boss Armitas is going to provide insight into what it's like being a brand new commanding officer for such a historic organization and his priorities as the team prepares to transit to El Central California for winter training. Boss Armitas is also going to discuss his two decades of naval experience and what drove his decision to pursue his current role with the Blues. All this and more, so please join me in welcoming Boss Alexander Armitas to the podcast. All right, welcome back to the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Notoff, and we're extremely privileged today to be joined by the latest and newest flight leader of the Blue Angels, Commander Alexander Armitas. Boss Armitas, a huge honor to have some of your time here, especially as we go into the holiday season. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ryan. It's great to see you. It's uh, great to be here. Yeah, great. Hey, so, I mean, you're more or less a, a month and a half into your brand new role as flight leader and commanding officer of the Blue Angels, and you're walking into this extremely historic organization heading into the 77th year. And even though you have two decades of naval aviation experience behind you, it's probably a pretty big undertaking for anyone. So I'm just curious, as you've walked in the door, what have been your priorities as you've stepped in here to, to month one and as you march towards winter training? You know, where has your focus been? What are, you, what are your priorities? That's a great question, and you're absolutely right. It's been uh, it's been a month and eight days since the change of command, so really just getting started here with the uh, with the whole process. Um, the Blue Angels, as I think most people know and would agree, are a, a unique organization. They're very different from uh, from kind of your fleet Super Hornet squadron or really any fleet command that's out there. Uh, so my priorities stepping in have really been to uh, I'm I'm not one to make waves stepping in. Uh, the beauty of this organization and really one of the most incredible things about it are the people that are here. And the people that have been here are all exceptional. And uh, this group is no exception. Uh, Boss Kesselring before me, Boss Doyle before him, all the way back to the beginning. Uh, they just have had some outstanding leaders, some outstanding people. So there's really uh, the beauty of coming to a place like this is generally speaking, there's not a whole lot that has to change. The squadron is very strong, full of talented people and really capable already. So my goal really to come in here is to get to know the people. Something very different about the Blue Angels from your typical fleet squadron is uh, we don't use the fleet up model here. So in a fleet F-18 squadron, you're going to be the executive officer, the second in command for 15 months normally before you become the commanding officer. That opportunity is, uh, or that time really is your opportunity to get to know everybody and learn the command with a different CO. Uh, we don't really get that here. So a big thing for me is to learn the people, get to know them. And it's it's a little more to me than just getting to know their names and where they're from, but the kind of people they are, what their backgrounds, what what really drives them. Get to know the people. Uh, after that is really get to know the demo. I've got to learn the demo. I've got to be, uh, we've got an air show coming up here in March and uh, we've got to be ready to go for that. So not that far away. And then, uh, and then finally just earning the trust of the rest of the team. That hopefully will happen on its own, but that's a priority for me. We've, we've all got to trust each other and uh, it's never too soon to start on that. Yeah, absolutely. And so part of that process, I think you guys are actually doing some flying right now over Pensacola. It's December of 2022 right now. So like you mentioned, Drop a Salute was just over a month ago. What type of flying are you guys doing right now? Uh, are you guys doing formations or, or air show maneuvers? What, what's going on over there over Pensacola? We are. We are. Uh, we're flying every day. We're flying twice a day. Five days a week is what we schedule. Uh, Pensacola weather in the winter, just like just about anywhere else in the winter, is not ideal. So we've we've lost a few here and there uh, to weather where we, we have to cancel the event. But typical day is two flights each. Uh, the solos will go out and do uh, individual training kind of together. And then the diamond goes out and does their training. And we're doing two flights each of those per day, really focusing on the foundations of, of Blue Angel maneuvering. So very basic, you know, turns descents, climbs, turning our smoke on and off together, uh, doing everything on the radio that we normally do, all the communication to make sure that we all understand. One of the, one of the things I'm learning very quickly is, uh, is as, the, as the flight leader, my cadence, my, my speech cadence on the radio is what drives the timing on these maneuvers. So giving the wingman an opportunity to hear my voice and hear the way I say things, which uh, I try to mimic Boss Kesselring as closely as I can to make it, uh, to make it easier, but uh, it's not exactly the same. So giving them an opportunity to do that uh, and then finally, uh, just yesterday, in fact, we flew our first flight with the Delta. So we had all six jets together yesterday for just some very, uh, very kind of basic, uh, basic maneuvering with the six jets together in the Delta formation. 
Nice. And sticking on this theme of flying, obviously the Blue Angels, a lot of high performance flying, a lot of heavy Gs and a rigorous schedule uh, on top of that, right? So are you making any adjustments to your physical fitness regimen or your your diet to kind of accommodate, you know, this increase in, in high performance flying? Uh, a great question. I wouldn't say that I've adjusted it per se, but I'm trying much harder to be, a, I'm trying to improve the discipline, I guess. I've I've always tried to keep a, a reasonably good diet um, and uh, keep a reasonable fitness regimen, but the the what the Blue Angels I think and the schedule the Blue Angels keep and the type of flying the Blue Angels do, there's a lot less room for error in that. So missing a meal here and there, which is pretty common in the fleet, especially when you're on the boat and and just the way that works, uh, you can't really do that here. There's just not enough room for error. So trying to be really hard on myself to make sure that I am getting the exercise every day, make sure that I'm eating right and eating enough. Uh, every day and ensuring that I'm in good shape because uh, there's uh, it is very demanding, as you said, and I uh, want to make sure we're ready to go every time we fly. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about your background, right? You're from Skinny Atlas, New York. Uh, so that's near Syracuse, just south of Lake Ontario there. Uh, what in your youth, when, what really inspired you to pursue a career in aviation or, or a military career in general? Where, where, when did that really happen for you? Uh, it started a long time ago. I, I wish I had a great, easy, clean story about this one thing I saw that inspired me, but it's really been kind of bits and pieces here over the course of my life. Uh, one of the very early memories I have of aviation and military aviation uh, at the time, and unfortunately they're not there anymore, but uh, based out of Syracuse, New York, the Syracuse airport was a uh, an Air National Guard F-16 unit. Uh, prior to that, they flew A-10s. I think they're actually flying Predators now or uh, one of the unmanned vehicles, but um, they would fly a diamond formation uh, over all the small towns in the region every 4th of July. And I remember as a very young kid seeing them fly over and thinking that was just really cool. Uh, that kind of started my interest in aviation. I actually worked at the Syracuse airport when I was in high school. Uh, and my dad worked there for a little while for FedEx. He worked uh, on their ramp, kind of managing some of that. So some exposure to airplanes got me into aviation. The military side, I think, came a little bit later going through high school, kind of read. You know, I saw Top Gun uh, as a kid. I... Uh, which is a very, very popular topic right now. You know, I read the kind of the early Tom Clancy books, Flight of the Intruder, things like that, that just kind of found their way to me and really got me into uh, into aviation and really military aviation. And then uh, a little bit later is when I kind of settled on the Navy. And I think the the appeal to the Navy for me was the aircraft carrier. That's generally regarded as the hardest thing to do in aviation is land a high performance jet aircraft on a carrier. And, uh, and that's what I wanted to do. And when you did your press conference, when you were named the flight leader of the Blue Angels, uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that you saw the Blue Angels fly an air show in Toronto uh, in your youth. So I'm a bit of a history nerd with the Blues. You and I are roughly the same age. I saw the Blues fly there. My first, you know, the first air show I went to was 1987. So they had just transitioned to the F-18 Hornet. I'm just curious, did you, were they in your first air show, were they still in the A-4 Skyhawk or F-18 Hornet? You know, it's funny, you might be the one, you might be someone that can help me with this, uh, figuring out exactly where they were and when I saw them the first time. I believe it was actually the London Air Show in Ontario. When I was in middle school, we had a, we had a family friend that would take, uh, that would take my friend from school and I up to the London Air Show. I went up there two or three times. Uh, and at least one of those, I saw the Blue Angels perform. To your question, I, I do not recall ever seeing anything other than F-18. So uh, my, every memory I have of the Blue Angels is in the F-18. Uh, which might be why I love the airplane so much, but uh, that's all I've seen. Gotcha. Makes sense. So uh, let's talk about uh, you, you end up going to the Naval Academy class of 2002, I believe, and uh, what degree in aeronautical engineering. Pretty impressive. We could probably talk about your background for quite a bit of time, but we don't have the time. So if you don't mind, if you could just summarize your very impressive kind of two decade career so far in the Navy with uh, the different squadrons you've been in, different deployments, uh, et cetera. Sure. Uh, I appreciate you calling it impressive. I'm, uh, I don't know that I've done anything exceptional, but I do appreciate that. Um, my career started in uh, VFA 115, the Eagles. Uh, that was my first fleet squadron. So after flight school and the FRS, uh, they were based out of Lemoore, California at the time. Uh, and I deployed three times with them. So I deployed each year I was there. I was there for three years uh, after VFA 115. Uh, and during those deployments, excuse me, I supported uh, Operation Iraqi Freedom. Uh, in Iraq on one of the cruises, and then later uh, Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. Uh, went from there, went through the Top Gun course, uh, graduated from Top Gun, and then went to uh, Strike Fighter Squadron 122, the Flying Eagles, who uh, is the West Coast FRS for the F-18 uh, Super Hornet. Later, they picked up the Hornet as well for a brief time. I uh, was an instructor there. Following that, I went to a training officer tour at VFA-14, the Top Hatters, also in Lemoore. Uh, deployed again with VFA-14, supporting Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. 
uh, and then finally made my way to the East Coast. So after that, out to Oceana, joined the Puke and Dogs at VFA 143, deployed with them. Uh, we did Operation Inherent Resolve in Iraq and Syria uh, with 143. After that, left to uh, go to Millington, Tennessee for a very quick tour at the Navy, uh, Navy Personnel Command, and then uh, back to Oceana for a executive officer and command tour with the Gunslingers at VFA 105. Deployed twice with VFA 105, uh, supporting uh, what was Enduring Freedom and is now um, Freedom Sentinel was the final name for the operations in Afghanistan. So we did kind of the last two deployments or close to the last two supporting Freedom Sentinel. Uh, and then that was it. Finished up in May of 2022 in VFA 105 and uh, came down here to Pensacola. And obviously somewhere along the way, you got your call sign, which I believe scribed. Do you want to give us the origin story for your for your call sign there? Sure. It's, uh, it's not a very exciting story, and it also wasn't one event, which is pretty common with call signs. Uh, I'm not a drinker. I never have been. Uh, I, don't, I don't have any problem with drinking. It's just not something I ever really got into. Uh, but as a result, uh, when I'm out with the squadron and out with the ready room and out doing things, I tend to be the guy that remembers everything that happened. Uh, just not to say that uh, other people can't remember things, but once in a while, you know, maybe a memory here or there slips away uh, when it gets late into the night. Uh, so as it was, every time we'd go out as a squadron, the next morning, I was kind of the one helping everybody, everybody piece the night together. So, uh, I became the keeper of history, uh, which kind of morphed into a scribe and that's, uh, that's how I got it. Nice. Uh, and, and so eventually you made the decision to volunteer or put an application in to, for the leader of the blue angels commanding officer, uh, what inspired you to do that? Did someone encourage you or was it a combination of things? Uh, yes, uh, definitely got some encouragement. Uh, it's kind of a funny story if, uh, for, uh, for your viewers out there that know John Hiltz, uh, former number two pilot, a uh, very good friend of mine. We went through flight school together. Uh, John gave me a call in November, uh, right before the applications were due and basically literally just called and said, I heard you were thinking about applying for the team. Uh, at the time, that was not the case. I really hadn't considered it. And, uh, and I told him that, and then we kind of had a discussion about it. And over the course of about an hour, hour and a half, John and I talked and, uh, he kind of kind of talked to me about it. And, and, you know, at the end of it, I said, yeah, I think, you know, I think I'll throw an application in. Um, kind of fortuitous for me, my timing originally didn't line up with Boss Kesselring, as, uh, as is the case with a lot of things in the Navy, timing matters. And uh, because of the extra year that he did on the team, that allowed me the opportunity to apply. It probably would have uh, would not have been a, a, a chance for me otherwise. Uh, but put the application in and, uh, and just kind of took it from there, went through the steps. And, uh, and here we are. And so, uh, as it was mentioned, when you did your press conference, there was essentially seven applicants that you went down to Pensacola with for that final day, uh, to be selected for the blues. Could you talk me through that day, your emotions, learning you made, you know, the team as commanding officer, of the blue angels, pretty special. Uh, it is, it's a, it was very special. It's a very emotional day. Um, more, I, I kind of knew it would be somewhat emotional. It was not, it was more than that. It was more than I expected. Uh, being out down there as part of a group of seven applicants, first of all, all seven of us, uh, certainly the other six are exceptional, uh, talented people, very good aviators, uh, very capable pilots and have had, have had incredible careers. So just being grouped in with them was certainly an honor. Uh, it was fun to go through that process. The advice that everybody gave us that's done this before, former bosses, boss Kesslering, everybody, you know, naturally we get down here and all they say is just relax and be yourself, which is great advice and exactly what they should say much harder to do in practice than you'd think. But uh, we did the interviews. And then uh, at the end of the day, uh, Admiral Westendorf, who was Sinatra at the time, uh, said my name as, uh, as the next flight leader. And uh, it was extremely exciting. Uh, to be honest, it was a little bit surprising. Again, with such a talented group to be the one picked out of that group was, uh, was really exciting for me, uh, a little bit surprising. And then, uh, and then it was kind of a whirlwind from there. So right into kind of the process, the press conference that you just mentioned, that's that happens quite literally about 15 minutes after the selection is, uh, is made. So uh, very quick, uh, very quick process there. And then uh, as soon as that day's over, it's right back to work. I was still in command of VFA 105 at the time. So it was, uh, it was the selection, the press conference, the dinner. And I was on a flight the very next morning back to Virginia Beach to, uh, to get back to work with the squadron uh, I was currently in. So when did you eventually, because you eventually do start joining the team and following them around for part of the, the 2022 air show season. Uh, how quickly did that transition happen? That's right. So it is very quick. Uh, selection was early April. Uh, my change of command was a month later in May. And then I had a little bit of downtime to kind of get the family moved. So we will move to Pensacola. We moved to Pensacola at the end of July. And then uh, I get there. I joined the Blue Angels just a hair earlier than the rest of the of the new officers. I joined in early August as part of the team just to just to start kind of getting through some of the administrative process of checking in. Uh, but it was September 7th was the very first day for all of us to be together uh, as, a, as a cadre of new officers and, and start kind of shadowing our, our counterparts on the team 
uh, it was the NASA Oceana Air Show, which was, I believe, two weeks later was the very first show we all went to. Nice. And then so eventually, I, I assume you get to fly in the back seat uh, during some of the air show weekends. Uh, how often did that happen for you? Were you in the back seat at some point through every air show weekend? And did you fly in each of the back seats at each of the different positions? How did that work? Yeah, we uh, so the training officer uh, and the operations officer kind of build a schedule to ensure that everybody gets some exposure to each of the different spots. Uh, in my case, especially, there was a, some emphasis put on being in every every position in the Delta, or at least as many as we could see. Um, but uh, it was not quite every air show. So I did uh, I don't remember the exact number, but it was six, I think, six to ten backseat flights uh, flew with. And it's really kind of broken out diamond and solo. I did fly uh, did fly circles, uh, finding all those checkpoints. I did that with uh, with the diamond flight. Uh, and with the solos. And then uh, I did a, a demo practice uh, with uh, the slot pilot, um, Chomps, last year. And then uh, with both uh, Chewy and Whiskers in the lead and opposing solo spots. So I got to do a demo with each of them, which was a lot of fun. Uh, and then there was one or two others just kind of here and there as the opportunities arose. Really a, a concerted effort to get all of the new pilots uh, some exposure to the demo prior to getting into this season. Great. And so, boss, as we wrap up here, uh, what are you looking forward to most in your first season as being the commanding officer of the 77th season of the Blue Angels? Uh, just the whole experience. I'm really excited to, to get out there and to, and to get to work on this demo. We're heading out to El Centro here in a couple of weeks to really start start grinding away and getting this demo together. As most of your viewers probably know, uh, every year on a normal rotation, 50 percent of the Delta pilots are in their first year. So kind of getting the demo together, getting our uh, getting all of our pilots uh, on the same page, building that trust with one another so we can get the demo together. And then the part I'm looking forward to the most to answer your question is really getting out there and showing the general public what the Navy and Marine Corps can do uh, to to inspire that culture of ex excellence that we talk about all the time and, and getting out there and showing, especially the parts of the country that maybe don't have a lot of exposure to the Navy and the Marine Corps, uh, what what you can what you can make with a with a team of ind individuals like the Blue Angels have get these airplanes out there, you get all these wonderful sailors and Marines out there and, and what we can do uh, when we all work together as a team and, uh, and put that on in front of uh, the American public. Well, boss, I can't thank you enough for making time. This has been a really great discussion. Best of luck as the team heads out to El Centro and can't wait to see you guys in the skies in 2023. I appreciate it, Ryan. Thank you again for having me. This was fun.